Welcome to C6 Chemical Synthesis and in this video we'll look at three strands the first one is reactions the second one is acids and alkalis and the third one is chemical synthesis which is the title of the module so first of all let's look at the formula examples of reactions so we're going to look at acids and alkalis, the formula of those, and the formula of some salts as well, which you have to know for the exam. So you have to know the formula for hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, aqueous. The gas, by the way, hydrogen chloride, dissolves in water. Nitric acid is HNO3. Sulfuric acid is H2SO4. Each hydrogen is 1 plus, and the SO4 is 2 minus, so it's neutral overall. Sodium hydroxide should be obvious, it's NaOH. The hydroxide group is OH. Sodium chloride is NaCl. Sodium carbonate is Na2CO3. CO3 forms a 2 minus, and each Na is a 1 plus, so you need two of them to balance it out. We've also got sodium sulfate. Sulfate is an SO4 2 minus ion, so therefore you need two sodiums to balance the 2 minus charge because each sodium is 1 plus. We've got sodium nitrate, which is NaNO3, and nitrate is a, a 1 minus ion, and therefore you need a 1 plus ion of sodium to balance it out. And we've also got some salts of magnesium, magnesium oxide, magnesium hydroxide, magnesium carbonate, magnesium chloride, and magnesium sulfate. So, using those rules, MgO is magnesium oxide, MgOH2 is magnesium hydroxide because each OH is a 1 minus ion and magnesium forms a 2 plus. Magnesium carbonate is MgCO3. Magnesium sulfate, MgSO4. And we've got calcium carbonate, CaCO3, and calcium chloride, CaCl2. Because calcium is in group 2, just like magnesium. So, reactions. We should know the types of reactions. We should know there are two types, exothermic and endothermic. Exothermic means it releases energy or heat into the surroundings. For example, combustion when you burn fuels. Endothermic means you remove energy from the surroundings, such as when you dissolve some salts. And exothermic reactions happen when you're making bonds, when you're reforming bonds, whereas endothermic reactions happen when you're breaking bonds, which is kind of obvious really because you need to put energy in to break the bond so therefore the energy comes from the surroundings. So if I take some fluorine diatomic and break it into two fluoride ions, what you find is it takes energy to break those bonds between the fluorine atoms, and therefore that's an endothermic process. But then once you've got those two fluoride ions, if you want to make them back into a fluorine molecule again, you need to add the bonds or make the bonds. And therefore... It's what we call an exothermic process. So we use a minus sign on the amount of energy to show that it's releasing energy in surroundings. So we can also say that because of the law of conservation, the amount of energy to make um, 2F turn into F2 is the same as the amount of energy going from F2 to 2F. And we can draw diagrams to represent exothermic and endothermic reactions if we show the energy on the y-axis and we show the reactants and the products if you put energy in to go from reactants to products then it must be an endothermic reaction and the energy comes from the surroundings whereas if you have a situation where the reactants have more energy than the products and it drops in energy level as they react energy is then released to the environment such as when you heat things via combustion. So now let's look at the rates of reaction. So firstly, we'll look at the mechanism of reactions. Why reactions must be controllable. We'll look at factors affecting the rate of reaction and we'll also look at how to observe 
the rate of a reaction. So, mechanisms. We rely mainly on understanding me um, rates of reaction by thinking of collision theory. And in that theory, we say there are a range of particles, different substances, which are shown in different colours, moving about randomly, random motion, bouncing off of objects, um, and they're travelling at speed, quite a high speed. And you see there that as they bump into each other, um, they react. But they need a certain amount of activation energy in order to react properly. And clearly the more often they meet, the more often they um, bump into each other, the more often they collide and react. And we say that the uh, rate of reaction is equal to the change in quantity of a product over time. So for example, if you have 120 paracetamol pills that you've made, and you've took 60 seconds to make it, well, if you divide 120 by 60, you get two paracetamol tablets per second. And that'll be the rate of that particular reaction. So, control. The first reason we have to control reactions is for safety. If it's too fast, if a reaction's too fast, there could be an explosion, or for example, corrosive acid um, could react very fast with your skin, therefore causing damage. It also needs to be economical. Um, if you've got a reaction that's too fast, it means you may produce more product than you need, and therefore you've got to store it, which costs, costs money. And by storing it, the shelf life means it may expire before it gets to the shop. If it's too slow, for example, how slow rusting takes months and months, you're not producing enough product and therefore you can't sell as much. And of course, if you can't control your reaction, if suddenly the demand increases, people want to buy your product more, and you can't increase your supply, then you're not able to sell as much as you can. Now, factors affecting rates of reaction include the temperature. So if you increase the temperature, you increase the rate of reaction. We also see particle size. If I draw some particles there, marble chips in hydrochloric acid, small pieces and large pieces, we see that the small pieces react very fast, whereas the large, large pieces take a longer while to react. And that means the smaller the particle size, the faster the rate of reaction. And the reason is small particles have much larger surface areas than large particles, and only the surface can react. What's inside the particle the part not touching the acid cannot react. And therefore, smaller particle sizes means more collisions overall. The next one is concentration. If I draw two diagrams there of beakers, and I draw concentrated acid, the dark blue dots, and the light blue dots are water, in the dilute acid there's more water than acid. And therefore, in the dilute acid, there's less of an active ingredient. So if I place magnesium in both of those acids, we see that the concentrated acid produces more bubbles of hydrogen because there are more collisions between the HCl, the hydrochloric acid, and the magnesium. Whereas in the dilute acid, there are less collisions because most of it is water, as it's less concentrated, and therefore the rate of reaction is faster in concentrated acids. Now using a catalyst increases the rate of reaction, and a catalyst is something that speeds up the rate of reaction, but doesn't react with the reactants and products. And therefore it's not used up in the reaction, um, and therefore it can be used again. Catalysts mainly pro provide a surface in which the reactants can come together to make a product. So, how can we observe rates of reaction? Well, we can collect gas and see how fast gas is produced, and measure the rate of which gas is produced by a syringe. We can measure the mass using scales, and as the gases are produced and come off, we can check how much that changes. Or we can see how fast a colour change happens by using what we call a colorimeter, and the faster the reaction, the faster the colour change, and therefore we can measure rate. So, let's look at acids and alkalis now. We'll look at testing, titrations, and formation of salts. And we should first of all point out that acids form H plus ions when they dissociate. Alkalis form OH minus or hydroxide ions. And if you do a H plus plus an OH minus, you get water, and that's why when acids and alkalis meet, they neutralize to produce water. We should remember the pH scale, which goes from 1 up to 14, although it's possible to go below 1 with very concentrated acids. And we see the colors there um, show the universal indicator what color it turns at different pHs. So if you've got a pH of 5, that's a fairly weak acid as it's quite near 7. 
whereas a pH of 13 is a pretty strong alkali. We can test out pHs using a pH probe, which is an electronic sensor that measures the pH. We can use a universal indicator, which can be either paper or liquid, or we can use litmus indicator. Now, litmus is a qualitative test, as it gives you a really clear colour change of red or blue, telling you if it's acid or alkali, but it doesn't tell you how acid or how alkali it is. Whereas universal indicator is, is semi-quantitative, because you can actually say how strong an acid is. Is it pH 1? Is it pH 3? Is it pH 5? So sometimes we said that universal indicator is, is, is better in the fact that it can give you a clear quantitative picture of the strength of an acid. So a titration is a way of seeing how much acid can neutralize the volume of alkali, and that can tell you how much strength, or concentration, I should say, the alkali has. And this is called a burette, this um, red highlighted piece of glassware, and it's graduated with small lines, and you can actually read it to within 0.05 centimeters to say how much acid has been used. So you pour acid inside the burette using a funnel, and you fill it up to a line, and you read the line to make sure you know the starting point. Then you fill the conical flask with an alkali. Um, if you know your concentration of acid, that's important. And in the alkali, you put an indicator, which turns another color when the alkali is neutral, and we call that color change the end point. So, when you open the tap on the burette, the acid starts to flood through and fill up the conical flask slowly. And after a while, eventually, you get a sudden color change, as I've shown you in there in red. And that indicates that suddenly there's been a neutralization reaction and the acid and the alkali are completely balanced. So if you see the end point of how much acid has been used and you measure um, how much acid has been used in total, you can then use that to work out the strength of the alkali. If you need more acid to neutralize the alkali, the alkali must be strong or more concentrated. So if I had 22.1 centimeters of acid and it neutralized 25 cent centimeters cubed of alkali, and that's a mistake they should say alkali Y, not acid Y, then how much acid would you need to neutralize 150 milliliters of alkali? So 25 times 6 is 150. So 22.1 times 6 is 132.6 centimeters cubed. So proportionally, that's how much you need. So in terms of formation of salts now, we're going to look at different reactions of salts and the names and formula of salts produced, which you have to know for the exam and work out. So we're going to look at acids and metals, acids and metal oxides, acids and metal hydroxides, and also acids and metal carbonates. So we'll first we'll look at calcium plus hydrochloric acid, magnesium oxide plus sulfuric acid, sodium hydroxide plus nitric acid, and lastly calcium carbonate plus hydrochloric acid, which is the re reaction that happened earlier with the marble chips. So calcium plus hydrochloric acid, the calcium and the chlorine come together to form calcium chloride, and it leaves behind the hydro part, which is hydrogen. So there's a word equation there, and the chemical equation. And remember, the hydrogen is diatomic, and therefore you have to balance the equation. So magnesium comes together with the sulfate part of sulfuric acid, because magnesium is a 2 plus, being in group 2, and of course sulfate is a 2 minus. So we get magnesium sulfate, and you leave behind the H plus of the acid, and the OH minus of the alkali to form water in the neutralization reaction. Then you've got sodium hydroxide plus nitric acid. Well, the sodium, the nitric part, forms sodium nitrate. And of course, the acid is the H plus ion. It comes with comes together with the hydroxide ion, which is a one minus, and it forms water. Again, a neutralization reaction. And the last reaction, the calcium, which is a two plus, comes together with two chlorines or chloride ions, two minus, to form calcium chloride, leaving behind um, the carbonate group and the H plus group of the, alcohol, of the acid, and therefore it forms carbon dioxide and water. So, pause the video and quiz yourself with the following reactions. First of all, magnesium plus hydrochloric acid, what is formed, both the formula and the name, and potassium hydroxide and sulfuric acid, what is formed. So, magnesium plus hydrochloric acid goes to magnesium chloride, and it leaves behind the hydrogen, which bubbles off. Whereas potassium hydroxide plus sulfuric acid forms potassium sulfate, and of course you're leaving behind um, water, because the 
H plus reacts with the OH minus of the alkali. So we're now looking at steps of, steps of purification in chemical synthesis and some calculations. So the main steps in purification include dissolving, the first round of filtration, evaporation, a second round of filtration, and then finally drying. Um, and we'll explore those steps one by one. So first of all, dissolving. If I take a product that I've produced, it's going to have some impurities or things that I don't want to have inside it. So if I take a beaker of warm water and I put in my product to dissolve it, any, any non-soluble impurities, that is impurities that can't dissolve, will stay as a solid, leaving the solution containing mostly my product. So now we can try and filter that mixture of solution and insoluble impurities. And I can take filter paper and pour in the liquid and the product that's dissolved goes through the filter paper, leaving behind the insoluble impurities on the paper. So we've already got a pure sample by the first filtration. Then you put your your solution into an evaporating dish and you evaporate the water forming crystals so your concentrated solution forms crystals and that's called crystallization and once you've got crystals you can then put the crystals in the filter paper again and you can pour through another solvent and what happens is the small soluble impurities now are not concentrated enough to form crystals so they pour through dissolve inside the solvent and they are separated from your crystals so that second round of purification removes soluble impurities now so now you've got rid of all the insoluble impurities and the soluble impurities so now you've got a fairly pure product definitely more pure than it was when you started off with and of course you then put it in one of two options either you can put it into an oven at about 60 degrees or a desiccator an oven will evaporate the water off leaving behind a pure substance and the desiccator has a chemical inside it which absorbs water and both do the same job of drying your crystals now you have to remember that most of those impurities could affect the way in which your product works especially in terms of drugs so you want pure drugs um, for medicines and that's why you purif purify them with that procedure so Yield means how much product you're left with after a reaction, and there are two branches. There's actual yield, which is what you actually get in an experiment, and theoretical yield, which is what you should get if your equation um, is correct and if um, nothing is lost in the reaction. So to work out the percentage yield, or how much product you've got compared to what you should have got, you can divide your actual yield by your theoretical yield, and then times by 100. So for example, if I had 90 grams of product formed, but I should have got 120 using the balance equation, then 90 divided by 120 is 0.75 times 100 is 75% yield, which is a pretty good yield. But you notice that 25% has been lost. So where did it go? It could have gone because your starting reactants were impure and therefore um, your products were likely to be less. Or it could be because in the experiment, you might have spilt some solution. When you were measuring, you might have done it very accurately. Um, errors in transferring liquids uh, as well.